Hello, friends, and welcome back to the new episode of r slash I don't work here, lady. Today, there are four great news stories waiting for us, so sit back comfortably and let's get started with our first story. Woman thinks I work in a place I don't two days in a row. I work for a charity that shares a building with other businesses, one of which is a garage that repairs, sells, and buys cars. The desk I sit at is right in the front window so I get the joy of having to let people into the building when the garage guys upstairs should be. This woman turns up yesterday morning tapping forcefully on the window right in front of my face, annoyedly pointing at the door to be let in. I oblige because this happens a lot as the businesses don't have the best signposting, and I really don't mind doing it. The garage guys usually get people to call them when they're downstairs so they know when to come out. This lady's quite posh and very sure of herself, I live in the UK, and she had that never-apologize, never-explain air some people in the UK who think the empire never ended have. She says she's looking to sell a car, so I ask if she called them. She said no, because she saw me and just thought she could tap on the glass. I point out to her that we are a charity, showing her signs with our logo, and I also pointed out their doorbell to her and told her she needed to go upstairs. All fine. Cut to today. I see her hovering about outside again, but I don't do anything because I clearly explained it to her yesterday. I'm happily working away when I'm abruptly interrupted by the same forceful tap on the window and her, this is an inconvenience face. I look at her for a second, my disdain clearly visible, then get up and let her in. This is how our conversation went. I have decided I don't want to sell the car. Okay. She just stares at me. You know I don't work for the garage, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I let you in yesterday and explained this all to you. I point out our signs again. Do you not remember when I said you had to go upstairs? Oh, I thought you were their downstairs officers. No, I clearly explained yesterday that we're a charity and have nothing to do with the garage. Oh, I see. And then she goes upstairs. Effing hell, I hate when people don't think. What can I say here? See you tomorrow. And our second story for today. This one happened to me the other day. It's short as I have zero patience for people. I was waiting to catch my commute flight home because I don't live where I'm based. Sometimes I have to ride on a competitor's aircraft and sometimes I'll check in at the ticket counter to see how many open seats are available. I do my thing and get my items that are required to get on my flight. Unknown to me at the time, my competitor canceled an Orlando flight, which as you can imagine is filled with obnoxious soccer moms and their bratty princesses. Of course, this is met with the usual screams, threats, crying, all the typical garbage you'd expect to see on YouTube. Now, my competitor has a very distinctive uniform for their pilots. You can't mistake their pilots for any other carrier's pilot, not to mention my lanyard has my company name on it in large letters. After four days of being on the road, I'm exhausted, hungry, and not in the mood for any human contact. My earbuds go in, music's on, and I'm enjoying my solitude. My happy time is interrupted by a slob of a woman, complete with stained sweatpants and tank top, demanding me to help her get to Orlando. I simply tell her I don't work for X, see the gate agent, and I walk away. That isn't good enough for the sweat hog. She follows me, demanding to talk to my supervisor. At this point, I decide to end the situation before it goes viral. I tell Miss Sweaty that I don't work for X and I don't care about her trip, so leave me the hell alone or I will call security. With that, I walk to my gate and get on my flight. She just expects you to drop everything like, hell yeah, let's go to Epcot. I'm not in the military. Shove off. This was years ago. My husband was in the army on his second enlistment, five or six years total at this point. He'd already been through a couple of deployments by this point. We were at a new base overseas and I'd gotten a job at the after school care facility on post. While his unit was getting ready to deploy for six months, so they were in the thick of all that, the chaplain was having pre-deployment meetings for all the spouses to talk about the changes to expect while our spouses are deployed, from practical issues to emotional stuff to disruptions in routine. Bear in mind, this was back when, if you were really lucky, you maybe got a 10-minute call from your spouse once a month. Maybe an email as well. Letters were still more common than anything. Now, both my husband and I are pretty easygoing, and we'd both been through a couple of deployments, so I already knew the drill, what to expect, how to manage, etc. So I decided not to bother with the meeting. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a fantastic resource for spouses, and they would do a post-deployment one as well to help everyone transition back to normal life with their spouses. 
but I didn't feel the need to attend. A couple days later, my husband shows up at my workplace and tells me he's been ordered by his lieutenant to bring me to the spouse meeting. This guy was a second lieutenant who was fresh out of OCS, was not prior enlisted, and my husband had socks older than this guy's term of military service. For those who don't know, a second lieutenant is the lowest ranked officer. They're the noobs, and it's very common for them to think they know it all and act accordingly. This guy was one of those. I was highly peeved, but not for one moment did I blame my husband. I could tell he was annoyed as well, but I knew that since it was a direct order, he had to obey it. I thought for a minute and asked him to hang on a minute so I could talk to my boss. Now, school was set to let out soon, and they needed me there because of adult-child ratio requirements, but I explained the situation to my boss and told her I'd be back as soon as possible. She understood the situation and said she'd fill in for me till I could get back. She was cool that way, and everyone on base, if they weren't military, was the spouse of one, due to being an overseas base. So they all knew and understood when stuff like this came up. Very rarely you'd get the random GS employee civilian on posts, but yeah, that was highly unusual. So I left with my husband, but instead of going to the chaplain's meeting, I told him to take me to his building where the second lieutenant was. He knew what I was up to and happily complied. Arrived at the lieutenant's office, knocked and went inside while my husband stood in the hall. I asked him why he had ordered my husband to fetch me from my job that I was needed at. He rather pompously mansplained to me that this was a required function and that I needed to attend. Oh, I let him have it. I didn't raise my voice much, but I did inform him in no uncertain terms that he had no authority whatsoever to order me to do anything. I was not in the military, not subject to his whims, and while he may be able to order my husband to come get me, he could not order me to go to the meeting. He tried interjecting at this point to say that I needed to go so that I would learn stuff about how to handle my husband being on deployment. At this point, I nearly blew my top. I've spent more time with my husband being in the field and on deployments than you've spent in the military. My husband does not own me. He cannot force me to do anything and neither can you. I will not be attending this meeting and you will not force my husband to take me there. I am going back to my job and if I hear that you tried to make his life miserable because of it, so help me, I will go up your chain of command and make sure you regret it. Now the building was not full, but it wasn't quite empty either. Oh, and the higher ups were in their offices pretty close by. They were also super cool cats. My husband might have been enlisted, but they respected the work he did and he respected them, and this lieutenant had been getting on their nerves as well. So yeah, they absolutely could hear what was going on, and I'm sure they enjoyed it. By the end of my tirade, the second lieutenant was nearly falling over himself to apologize. Uh, sorry ma'am, I apologize ma'am, it won't happen again ma'am. He knew he was in the wrong, and by this point he also knew I'd make a right royal stink if he tried to make me do anything or tried to punish my husband for my actions, or lack thereof. I left and my husband took me back to my job, grinning like a fool. I was still pretty enraged at this point, but was cooling off pretty rapidly. For a few weeks afterward, I actually was concerned that there might be fallout for my husband because of what I did, but there wasn't at least not more than the usual BS he dealt with on a daily basis. It was one of the most satisfying moments of my life. Like I said, I'm pretty laid back normally, but I will get steamed on other people's behalf. The problem is that I almost never have the opportunity or the right to get involved, and I recognize that sometimes doing so would definitely make bad worse. So having this opportunity was just golden. My old drill sergeant would have loved the dressing down you gave that butter bar. And our next story. A return to my box office roots. My first job out of college was doing customer service for a data company. Before then, I'd worked at the local theater company during college and had mastered dealing with cranky old people. On one of my first days at the data company, I got a call from someone looking for the city's Opera House box office. Confused, I googled the Opera House and found out their box office number was one digit off from my work phone number and I continued getting calls for the Opera House throughout the time I worked there and would usually tell the person the correct number and they'd hang up. But there was one time where a caller couldn't grasp that I wasn't the box office. The woman who called that day was definitely an older woman based on the sound of her voice. I tried to explain that I wasn't the box office and gave her the Opera House's phone number. She was confused and said that's the number she dialed, and she sounded a little panicked. I tried explaining the situation again, but could tell she wasn't getting it. She was quiet for a moment and then said, I just want tickets for Friday night. 
So I put on my best customer service voice and asked her for her name, how many tickets she wanted, and what section she wanted to sit in. She gave me the info, and I told her I was going to put her on hold. I put my work phone on hold and then called the Opera House on my cell. Thankfully, they had tickets available for Friday night, so I explained the situation and gave them her name. They said she could pay when she picked up the tickets at the box office. I took the old woman off hold and told her that her tickets would be waiting for her at the box office on Friday night. She was thrilled and told me all about how she was going to take her grandson to her first opera. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.